Welcome back, clubbers, to another First Issue Club podcast, a comic book podcast where we review First Issue Clubs only to, uh, right? We review, we review other clubs. First Issue Clubs only. <laughs> no! We're the best one. Other clubs that are out <laughs> yeah, there, we review a, them. This is a podcast where we review other podcasts that review First Issues. Yep. All right, let's try this again. Hello and welcome to uh, the First Issue Club podcast, the comic book, the only comic book podcast where we review First Issue Club, First Issue Club <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> we just review older episodes of our podcast. Oh, yeah. Is that the hint of episode four to me? <laughs> With nuances of six. <laughs> This is the First Issue Club podcast, and what we do here at the First Issue Club podcast <laughs> is we re- we review first issue comic books. And uh, sometimes buying comic books is not the easiest experience, but it should be the most fun and accepting experience. And if you looked at buying comic books through the lens of First Issue Club, you'd have a grand fucking time. And so uh, just listen to this podcast every week, and your life's going to be rich and filled with joy. Guaranteed. Boom. Or your money back. Oh, <laughs> we cannot guarantee that. <laughs> All right, what books are we covering this week? Uh, we are covering The Life of Captain Marvel on Marvel, Euthanauts on Black Crown, and The Mall from Scout Comics. All right, let's find out who's in the club today, and we read a book from Scout Comics called The Mall, and in the book they each inherit a store in a mall that is much like their interest in real life. So, if you were to inherit a store in a mall, what would it be? And what would you sell? This is Budget King, and I would have a store called the Mad Hattery, Battery, and Pattery Castle of Secrets. And in it, we would sell crazy hats, regular batteries, and give massages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do really like the idea of a massage parlor being called the Pattery. <laughs> and in a mall, like, hmm. You get, you get a, after you get a slice of Sabaro's pizza. <laughs> you go to the Mad hat, Hattery, <laughs> Battery, and Pattery <laughs> Castle of Secrets. You need to get your cheese centered. Um, this is Greg Lichtai, and my store would be called uh, Big Boy Hugs. And what it is, <laughs> is um, it's kind of like a therapeutic safe space place for adult men to go and kind of let their feelings out because in this world we're not we're kind of told to repress our feelings and not really express them you probably go there thinking i'm just gonna buy new shoes or you know go to mr bulky's again and get some candy but then you see a place called big boy hugs and you're like what is all this about and you kind of it's like a support group sit around in a circle tell people your problems let out a tear get a hug from a big boy i love the idea what where is money exchanged in this process? Um, so it we get grants from the government because this is like um, it's it's uh, it's therapeutic. It's mm-hmm. not really for profit. It's a non profit. <laughs> I have no clue. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and I think I would have a store that would sell clones of you, but specifically for icebreakers that you have to experience. <laughs> In your everyday life. it's um, It serves my main interest of just not ever doing that ever again. I've had to do it in class, in work. I hate it. And it would be kind of easy to, like, download your persona specifically for that event. So you could just sell them. They would expire after that, and you'd be done. You always have the best ideas. <laughs> Clones are us. No, because they're not really full functioning clones. It's just one purpose. Yeah, I like just calling it icebreakers. Icebreakers, yeah. Oh, nice. I have a great idea. Once the icebreakers are done with their task, so you don't have to like kill them prestige style, (laughs) (laughs) get rid of your clone. (laughs) They go to big boys huggery. Mm. Yes. And they do the hugs, and that's what keeps that store free. Yeah. You're getting all this free clone. We hug work. them to death. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> <You're just laughs> hugging the, the life out of them. <laughs> the whole time they're giving the hugs, they're just saying all these weird, like, one liner yeah. icebreaker answers. Like, <laughs> we'd have to shut that part down. I wrote in a hot air balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike DeStacy. Um, I'm an anxiety fueled person. And my store would have to represent that in some respects. 
That's why I would open Don't Worry About It, a store that sold embarrassing things only, like <laughs> lube and extra small condoms and fajitas. How are those? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, probably, are you embarrassed to order fajitas at a Mexican like, restaurant? Like double yeah. stuffed Oreos and there stuff you like that that uh, you're just like imba- embarrassed hemorrhoid to cream. buy. And it's Do like, yeah, know? hemorrhoid cream. You come in and you get any of these embarrassing things and mm. it's like, don't worry about it. It's all embarrassing. And on that note, let's get this podcast started. <laughs> All right, we got The Mall out on Scout Comics. Shout out to Scout Comics by Hanfield and Hake the Third. So Scout Comics released this as a zero on first comic book day. Wait, that's not a holiday. The holiday is called <laughs> Free Comic Book Day. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> first. Are you saying that this one was zero and then they came out with another zero after Free Comic Book Day? So I'll, get to, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. This is a number one, but the zero for this came out on Free Comics Book okay, Day. Okay, that's what, okay. So the mall is branding itself as a uh, breakfast club type comic book with uh, some mob shit. Essentially. They, yeah. The premise of the mall is three unlikely friends, some would even call them foes, high school people, inherit a mall from a mob boss. They are running shit stores in malls. They are dealing with uh, money, lots of money just being handed to them. And then also just dealing with being a high school. And a lot of them have pretty heavy, uh, fucked up lives. Yeah, if you if anybody walked down the street and said, hey, comic book set in the 80s, three high school kids inherit a mall from a mob boss, I'd be like, sure, take my money. <laughs> Let me see where that goes. What do you guys think? I love malls, so. So the only reason this was set in the 80s was just because malls suck now? Yes. Right? Is that the only purpose well, of making it? Yeah, it's not that they suck, but, like, malls were a huge deal in the 80s. Like, yeah. it was a culture. Like, you spent all day at the mall. They so, were the Amazon. So this wouldn't work now because you'd be like, oh, I'm inheriting a store in the mall. That's, like, more of a curse yeah. than a boon to me. It would be amazing, right. though. This this story now would be like, oh, I have I have this uh, women's feathered cap store <laughs> that sells bedazzled purses. Yeah, totally. Um, you sell potpourri. Yeah, right in front of a cell phone case kiosk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a uh, blank store with a drip in it. <laughs> <laughs> Calendars from two thousand four. This book was all over the place to me, and yeah. kind of to its benefit. Yes. like I kept it interesting and fun, I guess. But I was just kind of like, what the fuck? Like yeah. every page turn. Yeah. So there was Weird a good ride. There was a good amount of chatter with this book on Free Comic Book Day, and the cover for the Zero issue looks amazing. And I think that you know, just judging it off of its cover, and it was free. A lot of people liked it. Zero just dives in to where this comic book ends. So they're already running their stores. They're like already dealing with like mob shit, and like being high schoolers, which uh, in some ways read better. To me than this like I don't really need the setup of how fucked up their life is or why they inherited the mall right right mm, I kind of in, I don't want to say I enjoyed it but it definitely made me engaged and caring about them their okay. dynamics but before they, yeah all this stuff but they happens did it wrong. to them is it do you agree with that like they the the, the zero should have been this issue that we just read well I'll, I I think you're right in like a linear like how you write things, but I think if you want to get people hyped on your book, they did it completely right. They threw them into the action of it mm-hmm. rather than the setup of mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. This, but so this was they, like a total '80s theme. Like I expected, like a full-on montage, like of them like getting their inher- inheritance of the store and just like, like th- this is what happened in '80s movies. Like you've inherited a, a store at the mall, and you're just like, you have a blank check. Okay, is my other employee a robot, probably, <laughs> or like? <laughs> Is there, like, a dinosaur living in the basement that I have to befriend? Like, what the fuck is happening right now? (laughs) Here's some other 80s things that they, uh, you know, injected into this book to make you feel the time era Mm -hmm. was uh, racism and bigotry. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't know if those things were necessary for you to, like, understand the times of the book at all. It wasn't. And then also, on top of that, there were some 
dark complexities of the characters so you get an idea of like their home lives and the problems that they're having. Oh. Like one of the girls is getting molested. Another one is like getting beaten up out of a gang. Yeah, getting a gang beat up. And the other, the last of the three is having like, you know, hate spewn at him because he's Hispanic. Mm-hmm. It's just such a bizarre, yeah. like, like, it just seemed unnecessary to me. Like, and I don't, the whole point was just, aren't the 80s a fucked up time? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. What? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I thought that that was necessary. Because I don't think I would have been as involved, like... You just don't care about the feel for the characters? Well, yeah, and if it's just, like, this is an 80s high school hijinks romp where three kids just are given stores and that's mm-hmm. it, I don't know that I'm interested in that much longer than just, like, okay. Well, and, like, wh- so, horny mobster dad. Who's, <laughs> one, he's, like, Santa Claus because he's just, like, watching these kids grow up and, like, taking note of their interest and just, like, oh. Yeah, that's I weird. bet he'd love to work at a shoe store. <laughs> Like, well, if he kept that much tabs on them, he should have been helping them out way before. Yeah, maybe like saving up for college. Or getting her out of a house where she's getting molested or getting this kid yeah. and his single mom like more financial assistance. Right. Like, it's Which, very well, strange. It goes back to what I've always said. Mobster dad's the worst. <laughs> mm-hmm. They, they kind of allude that he's helping them out a little bit because he says like, oh, like that contest your mom won to get you like music lessons. Yeah. Like... Uh, who wins a contest for music lessons? Like, that was obviously, like, your mm-hmm. mobster dad. And he's got this, oh, oh, obviously moment. Yeah. But to Caitlin's point, help out the girl who's getting molested. Seriously, because the guy the also tells that kid who got the piano lessons, he's like, yeah, he stayed out of the picture because he realized you already had a good dad at home. And it's like, she doesn't. Yeah, yeah not you at can all. can maybe take him out. Yeah, Super he could die. Fucked. Also, if th- if there isn't a robot sidekick in this book, they're really fucking up the 80s theme. <laughs> yeah. I want a short you, circuit. You need Johnny Five in this for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Did, would you be happy if they had Alf, too? Oh, would oh, I? Boy. Change the game. <laughs> they really did, like, over 80s this, though. Because mm-hmm. they they use terminology that I'm I'm guessing that people mm-hmm. never used really did, in the 80s. Did people 80s. ever call somebody annoyed? Never. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, gag me with a spoon. Mm-hmm. When they weren't like joking around. Yeah, but you guys have never been teenage girls. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming if I'm about to learn something, I'll change my tune. But <laughs> <laughs> we all have our dreams. <laughs> Wait, so what do you have to tell us that a teenage girl? Just the vernacular that you even use with your girlfriends, which oh, okay. most of these girls are walking around with them, just their friends. They're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I guess, don't know. I guess that's you true. do talk. You just talk differently. <laughs> Man. It's the first day of eighth grade. I'm just so stoked. Like, I can't believe it. I I'm a, can't wait to go hang out with my friends. Hey, Greg, what's going on? Did you have a good summer? Hey, Mike, sure did. Saw my first bra. It was sweet. Dude, that's awesome. Totally. Man, what classes are you in first period? Um, math for turtles. <laughs> sweet. I have math for turtles, too. Righteous. Let's head to class. Let's go. Mike and Greg head to class. They lock eyes with the new girl in class, and she is sweet looking. Hey, Whoa. Hey guys, you want a tab? What's a tab? Tab is a diet soda that's only from this era that will soon become unpopular. Yeah, I'll take a tab. Greg, she's a babe. Totally. Shut up and don't ruin this. Take the tab. Ask her her name. Hey, sweet mama, what's your name? I only date guys with cars. I have a few of them, but they're matchbox. Does anybody have some cocaine? Whoa! (laughs) This girl's a party nerd. And this has been a very special episode of First Issue Club. Don't do cocaine. Now we have you. Euthanauts on Black Crown by Howard N. Robles. Euthanauts is about a young woman working at a mortuary who is fascinated by death. During a casual lunch with her friends where she stares at a woman who's riddled with cancer and later has an encounter with her in the bathroom where she's assaulted by the woman with her air tank. (laughs) Uh, From there, the book explores the themes of death, life after death, and exploring the unknown, and also how to be condescending to a somewhat helpful apparition. 
This book is very heavy-handed with its thoughts about mortality, and I want to know how you guys felt about this book and its thoughts about death in the afterworld. I thought it was cool. I think it. I feel like I'm standing alone on an island by myself with my opinions about this book. I thought it was cool. It's yeah. So this old lady that's on the verge of death. We find out later she's this like really brilliant scientist who has these like crazy theories about like what death and the astral plane is like post death, and she basically brains this woman in the bathtub. Yeah. Or sorry, in the bathroom. Uh, once she figures out she's, like, intrigued by death, I guess. Very um, quick, you know, assessment process right, for yeah. Dr. Wolf. Just like, oh, you're interested in death? Bonk. Yep. <laughs> you're <laughs> perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're working with me oh, yeah. now. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she's like, good news, I was right. There is some sort of, like, afterlife. So she wants, like, this woman to be, like, half dead so she can go back to everybody that's, like, still alive and say, hey, I've seen death in the astral plane, and Dr. Wolf's studies were correct. Um, but, man, what a confident stroke with the air yes. tank. <laughs> to just be like, yes. I'm only going to half kill you <laughs> well, for a not little only bit that, of time. I'm also going to die in an hour. Not only... <laughs> yeah. yeah. She not kills herself that. right afterwards. Yeah, but she has placed all of her faith into this woman being her tether, Yep. which is the only thing that keeps her from fading away. Right. Someone in the real world or the the waking world, has to care about you. And, and know you. And know you for you to continue to exist in the death plane. We're expl- <laughs> This sounds so <laughs> abstract and crazy, right? Yes. Uh, and it is. I mean, this book is. It, it, I, had to, I had to read it twice before yeah. I appreciated yeah. it. In the, in the liner notes in the back, which we like a lot, this book is death positive. Yes. Which is not a term I was familiar with. <laughs> I don't um, know. Is I it a term? kind of think they're being tongue in cheek with it. Yeah, I hope so. I yeah, because who's death negative? <laughs> Who who's protesting death in the streets saying, "Heck no, <laughs> we won't go." <laughs> I think everybody. In, yeah. <laughs> Immortality yeah. forever. Nobody. I, I think yeah, the, the vast majority of people are not saying, "Yay, I want to die." No, I agree with that. So that's where I'm. I, I yeah. hope it's tongue in cheek. There's like this book's very death positive. There's mm-hmm. no like derogatory oh, terms it's, it's towards defi- death. Definitely, it's definitely tongue in cheek. Then that's brilliant. If not, you know how Yelda. I know it's tongue in cheek because anytime you get a character to say the name of your comic book in your comic book, you either are a piece of shit or you don't take yourself that too too seriously. Is that like the thing like in movies they say like. Uh, if they say the name of the movie in the movie, you're like, aha. Yes. He's, Adam Sandler just said Punch Drunk Love. <laughs> Jurassic Park Lost World. Uh, but yeah, they, they get the characters to say it and even tell you why they're called euthanauts. Um, at least they're like doing a little word play on what they do. Okay, yeah. So I kind of, I know we're saying that's really corny and dumb to do, but I kind of appreciated it because it didn't click for me when it was the like actual title I'm of the comic. Actually, being serious, I okay, think, yeah. I think it's a complete dichotomy. I think yeah. you can you either don't take yourself that serious, uh-huh. and it's like a fun tool, or you take yourself way too seriously, and you are a tool, um, <laughs> and you're in tool. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think there's people that are like very afraid of the afterlife too, mm-hmm. and this book kind of explores that, like the fear of death. Or like looking forward to death, there's like a couple different people that were introduced to, and they look at death. That's honestly ways. what I liked about the interview that mm-hmm. they did at the end. And they're like, "So, what do you think? Is there an afterlife?" And he was like, "I hope so. Like, I kind of think there is, mm-hmm. but I don't know, you know." And I think that that's like a really interesting thing for somebody that's like dealing with death so much to be like, "Yeah, there's probably an afterlife." Like normally, you just, especially the way Black Crown brands themselves, yeah. you would be like, "Nope." Mm-hmm. You, you go into a grave. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is that Black Crown books are very like I don't give a fuck sort of people. At least from yeah my experience with them. Yeah. But the, it seems like the message in this book is like if you give a fuck and like care about your existence and your being, then you will continue to exist. And if you don't give a fuck, you just cease to exist. Like oh, like de- your, your will. Like, like death is is a continuation or an ending depending on. How you handle it, um, I think. Yeah, that's, I, with, I agree with, how, with that. With how this book ends. Yeah. 
Um, because people have to remember you and care about you. Right. All right. So next up, we've got The Life of Captain Marvel, probably the most hubbub of the week surrounding this book. It's by Margaret Stoll and Carlos Pacheco. If you recognize the name Margaret Stoll, it's probably because you're a nerd. She did Beautiful Creatures, which was a novelized series of kind of like YA fantasy books that were very popular. Um, We talked a little bit about some of the Marvel Fresh Start series. This was one we were super stoked about. A woman writer who's um, very cool, doing interesting things. Um, She wrote the Mighty Captain Marvel, I believe, is what it was called, and it's that was a critically acclaimed comic book. And here she is giving us a one of five series on the life of Captain Marvel, which, as the name kind of insinuates, we're getting a look at some of Captain Marvel's life beyond being a superhero. And we find she's kind of battling some demons. It's interfering with her work in the Avengers taking a break from the Avengers, she decides to go back home and finds that life isn't so simple back at home either. It's just as complicated as being a superhero was. But she still needs to spend that time and figure herself out in her real life to get, I guess, some resolution in how she grew up and what made her who she is today. I think something that we've traditionally said we've loved about comic books is that we take a more serious look at these superheroes who are very surface level as human beings and what makes them tick and what makes them defenseless and um, what gets at them as as people. I thought this was a really interesting book that did a good job of that and at some point gets a little sci-fi and wacky at the end too and kind of takes you, makes you take a step back. <laughs> Well, her origin story is sci-fi, though, right? Her origin story is certainly sci-fi. But her origin story is a superhero, not necessarily as a person. Not as a person. Sorry, I, yeah. But that's, I mean, that's important, though, mm-hmm. I think. Well, I'll say, what did you, so what did you guys think about, like, the we, we kind of get this scene where she's having a bit of, like, an anxiety attack breakdown during a fight with the Avengers at the top of the book, where it's flashing back to her abusive father and their family, and it is getting into her fight with her, like, present-day nemesis versus the Avengers. And Captain America and Iron Man are like, whoa, shit, take a step back. You're going to, like, kill this person who's, like, not a real threat to us. You're just, like, beating the shit out of this person, kind of getting lost in yourself. And she can't breathe, starts having a panic attack, decides to take a break from that. Well, I mean, that's a pretty traumatic event that she is flashing back to and she's witnessing her two brothers get assaulted by their father which any grown adult who attacks children is you know a scum, terrible, scum a of the earth human being, yeah. to begin with so and you kind of get the sense that this isn't the first time or the last time yeah. this dad has done this so i'm sure it it is it, it was just inter- interesting to me that these superheroes are supposed to be the most powerful beings on the planet and here to protect us and still they can be triggered by these past events in their lives and they feel smaller than they actually are and they feel powerless and it's just it 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 adds a dynamic to these characters that they're not invincible even when you are invincible Mm -hmm. i think too like for her this whole i always look at like what they call them like this is part one which is trapped and i was kind of I, I never really paid much attention to that before. I think you're the only one that looks at that. Thing. I look at it all the time now because it makes so much more sense. You get a, a big lens on like, okay, what themes should I be looking for here? And she is, I don't know that it's totally about the abusive father. I think she's pissed at her mother who's being so passive and enabling of all of this stuff that's happening. And then she's also pissed at her brother because he's the one getting abused and is standing by the family as a unit and mad at her because she left. And I think really for her, maybe that's why she's so like messed up about it being Father's Day because she couldn't ever right the wrong in her family and she just had to leave because no one else saw it as as bad as she did. And she just took off and then they got mad at her for it. 
Yeah, so what we're talking about is that ultimately Captain Marvel goes back to her hometown or at least where her family spent their summers. They still have this summer house, and her father has since passed, and her brother and mother are in this home, and she goes and sees them. They get into a fight over whether or not, you know, she was there for their father, whether she's there for any of the hard times or good times, and she's kind of cherry-picking when she wants a family and when she doesn't. She needs a family really bad right now. You know, some problems come with having a family, right? Mm -hmm. Out of that, we get, you know, two disgruntled siblings. She finds her brother at her their dad's uh, gravestone. And, oh boy, <laughs> mm-hmm. does this get, like, a little intense and crazy from there. Um, yep. Quickly, very quickly. Yeah. So they have a fight over it. We talk about, we get alcoholism as a theme in this. He buzzes off drunk and starts driving home. Carol lets him do it. She ends up punching the gravestone and destroys it while, like, having it out in a monologue to herself with her dead father because they never had that, like, last conversation. She hears a car crash from far away. It's her brother who's fallen off of a bridge in his car. She rescues him, but he's been, like, you know paralyzed and brain damaged from this fall in a way she could probably blame herself for letting him go oh yeah she definitely feels responsible for it yeah you know she tries to save him but she can only be so much of a hero in this situation like what's done is done right so she needs her family who knows if her family needs her at this point she's kind of in a weird place like she can't come back and be the hero now she's kind of feels like she's playing the one, bad guy at this one point. of them one of the most beautiful scenes in this book was when she arrives home her brother's playing basketball in the back and they play horse yeah together and she like kind of talks about the dynamic of like letting him win or she she honestly is just yep. like it, it, a superhero could still lose at a horse to their brother mm-hmm. and i think like that's such a really cool scene to watch mm-hmm. and write they, they totally have a sweet moment don't they right there and then immediately it goes to, you know, bitter resentment and them calling them each other out, which mm-hmm. is, like, so what family is like, at least, in, yeah. you know, my experience that, like... Especially th- at the dinner table. That was yeah, the most right. important thing. Totally. Like, they got you at the dinner table. We have you cornered now. Mm-hmm. Just like, so, where you been? I think I'm, like, I'm a mature adult right now, and or at least I think of myself as that, <laughs> but if like I like a couple years ago, I went on a trip with my dad, and I got frustrated and devolved into a child again, and I was just like yelling at him, being very immature, and I think family is just one of those safe places where you can just like snap and you you know you like love people unconditionally, but you have like more problems with them yeah, than you, you have, have with, any... like, anyone else, yeah. right? And and you, you see... You have more history with them than you would anyone else. Right, you see all of that in the matter of, like, you a couple... You also have the ability to have more forgiveness, too, which Totally. Yeah. You, you, you get all of that in a couple pages here, which I think was just brilliant storytelling. A great way to just, like, immediately jump you into, like, what family is and what family means right away. And so when he's paralyzed, Captain Marvel stays with him, with his with her brother for a long period of time, and they show that passage of time by her hair growth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, by the way, to, like, and Tony Stark's the one to point that out. I wanted to talk about that. Like, I wonder if they're going to be pulling themes from her family as the Avengers, too, because they're letting her go off, and they're actually pushing her to do it to figure out why she just beat someone almost to death. Right. And then I guess nine months is too long to do that because they're like, oh, we wanted you to do it, but I guess there was a time limit on it because now we need you back and you need to like... Remember that whole saving the world thing? Right, you need to come back and do that now. And they're not saying it like an ultimatum, but they're just... Tony keeps showing up and asking her when she can come back. And it seemed to me like if I'm thinking about what's the point of that, other than to show her dedication to stick it out with her family now, maybe there's going to be a deal about like... She is torn between two families now. I think you're completely right, and I think it it served very well to show that she had easy outs so many times to just say, forget it, I'm going to leave, and I can dip into this family and dip out of this family whenever I want. But now that she's been a part of something that had real repercussions, she wants to, like, really, I guess, absolve herself or figure out what role she plays 
in this. Um, and she's still finding out worse stuff about her dad the whole time. Yeah, had an affair. Oh, we didn't get to the lockbox. She oh, finds yeah. a lockbox in her parents' house with this letter that her dad wrote to a woman. Um, Which I thought was a man. That isn't. When I read it the first time. I thought it was too. That was confusing. Yeah, signed to Joseph. Was but her, da- her dad's Joseph? name is Joseph, yeah. I think. Which I think is why they call Joe this... Jr. Yeah. yeah, and the suitcase on the front says <laughs> JD too. I didn't know if that. I think it's Joseph Danvers, but. Yeah, Joe, comma, dad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, sure. That's how that's every what, yeah. father or soon to be father right. monograms their suitcase. Yeah, that's how they write their concubine. Also, <laughs> monograms suitcases. That it is a pretty big monogram, but I think it's supposed to say yeah. she's got that baggage and her own baggage. So then I know. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. God damn it, Caitlin. <laughs> Layers. Uh so then this device that's also in this box that he you find out he had a mistress or he had an affair. Yep. She tries to fiddle with the device. The device sends a sperm. A signal. Up, just a signal. It's just a signal. Okay. Up to space that causes a birth of a child. A Cree baby? Also known as a sperm. Not a Cree baby. No, it's Cree. I think it is Cree. They allude to it. So, yeah, you see, like, a little laser go up into space, and then it shows this cluster of mechanical orbs, and the laser hits one of the mechanical orbs, which then releases two, like, little nano-sized pods that I'm assuming release, like, an egg and a sperm. It has to. And then it immediately grows a fetus. Okay, so so, somebody somebody explain this to me, then. So So bizarre. I don't know if I can. (laughs) He had an affair with somebody. Yep. And was he fucking an alien? He must have been. Yeah. That okay. must have been like her mother might not be her actual mother. Well, doesn't uh, yeah. Carol Danvers have Cree blood? Yes. Yeah. So, but, but so do a lot of other people on Earth. I think we learn. But she got it from like, Marvel, right? She didn't get it. She from... her, her powers were imparted to her oh, by Marvel. Okay. But yeah. she but, had the blood already. But she had the Cree blood already. Yeah. So maybe. This could be like hearkening back to Caitlyn's store, mm-hmm. a clone of Miss <laughs> Marvel. Because mm. if if this Cree alien and Joseph had sex, like maybe he sh- the alien just saved that DNA. Couple couple things for people who may not know: what is Cree? It's an alien race, and why is it significant in Mar- the Marvel universe? Because they are very reminiscent in um, features to humans. They're the closest human like. Uh, race, and but he, they have special it's a, strength and powers. Or a whatever. huge explanation for why a lot of characters end up with superpowers. I and, feel like Inhumans. Mm-hmm. Am I right? Is yeah. that right? I was going to ask that. Or are, yes. are all all have Cree blood? Yeah. Okay. And then who is Marvel? He's the original Captain Marvel, right? And he. Um, his last name is Marvel. His his like alien name is Mar Dash Vel. Okay. The author here talks a little bit about how she gets to create Captain Marvel and writes a beautiful letters to the editor. It's so good. I loved it. Comparing her own journey um, as an accomplished author in a mostly male dominated society to Captain Marvel's journey of being a superhero in a male dominated uh, workforce of superheroes. I thought was really good, and and the, well, the other mm-hmm. thing I like about her letter, there too, was how self-deprecating it was. Was it was like she's like I never wanted to be the hero, the author, um, and Captain Marvel never wanted to be the hero, but they had to kind of figure out what st- what spotlight meant. You straight up did it again to us, Marvel. <laughs> Got into a little feelings and emotions and you <laughs> tickled them in all the right spots and oh places Lord. and we're gonna take those memories and we're gonna bag and board them <laughs> keep them precious in <laughs> mint condition in our collections and never open these comics ever again <laughs> This has been another installment of the First Issue Club podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We couldn't be happier with your presence here. If you enjoyed this podcast, we ask that you do one simple thing, two simple things. Tell somebody that you love them and also rate and review our podcast. Do you want me to tell someone that I love them? (laughs) Or am I telling someone I love First Issue Club?
I want you to spread love in the world. It's a dark and lonely place for some people. Got it. Be a positive voice to your whatever neighbor. Whatever that means to you. Yes, whatever that means. After you've done those two things, uh, take notice of a couple of things. We're produced uh, by a wonderful person named Matt Hodap. He's a good guy. Uh, we have our music done by Primary Color Music. Those are good people. Our podcast is published and released on a family of podcasts called the Fountain City Frequency Family of Podcasts. Family is a word we add there, but it is truly family, and we're happy to celebrate all the other good podcasts that are there. And finally, we're recorded in KCUR Studios, so thanks so much for joining us here today. And now it's time to say our goodbyes. <laughs> that was radio voice, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Uh, here's my goodbye. For you guys, um, I'm, tr- I'm having trouble recalling a movie, and I think it's called To Your Mom, um, and it stars Robin Williams as like a perma kid. Um, Jack? Off to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Got did, you, him. did you guys talk about this beforehand, and you were like, I bet I can get Greg to say this? Ooh. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. I love being a rube. And with that, I'm Greg Lichtai signing off. I'm Caitlin Morosic, and I will show myself out. Um, so the other day, I couldn't believe this. I had a flat tire on the side of the road, and I was about to call AAA, couldn't find my card anywhere, and I thought I'll just get in the back of the car and get out that thing that lifts the car. What's that called? A car jack? Jacked. Your mom. <laughs> your mom's jacked off. Got your, your mom's jacked off. Was there a joke of the day calendar that I missed? <laughs> and I'm Mike DeSedacy, and this is First Issue Club. The other thing that we need to announce is that the results of the Summer Slam ended up in, like, a very slim margin of uh, the independent podcast uh, winning. And I think I really wanted... I was part of that one, so it's no big deal. But oh, um, Here we go. Uh, I really wanted to celebrate it, but the the... Real celebration is we had so many votes and participation, and it was so close that uh, I mean, I we Mike and I are the champions, but mm-hmm. and um, Sarah and Sarah, yeah, and Sarah is a champion for a whole fucking year, which is crazy. Um, so thanks to <laughs> you know everybody, I guess. But um, and the real true, shaking his the head. true spirit of this is that we're all collusion. we're all winners. Yes, we all are winners because we really uh, like it when you guys interact with us on social media and you voted for us and that was really cool so keep it up but well they didn't vote for us but you did vote for the wrong person but (laughs) that's fine (laughs) I literally think we won by like four votes if that I didn't know Russian bots were so cheap (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's true I used all of my excess email accounts to create Facebook (laughs) uh, people which are all our reviews anyway okay bye bye